Hi everybody, I'm Jenny Jewell, a retired emergency dispatcher, and we're hanging out in the break room. You see my headset is off. And this is where we talk about 911 adjacent things, just not actually breaking down a 911 call. And in this break room, we're going to talk about an incident that happened in Fall City, Washington State, uh, earlier this week. And this fine gentleman, Mike Mellis, who uh, was the PIO, Public Information Officer, for this incident uh, with the King County Sheriff's Office, had a press conference the, the day of, and that, again, was a few days ago. I do have an update that we're going to go over after this, but I want you to be able to get up to speed. So let's go ahead, and it's a family annihilation, and it reminds me a lot of uh, the Christmas Day Carnation family annihilation murders in Carnation, Washington. Kind of feels like that, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see when the trial comes out. But anyway, let's go ahead and give Mike a listen here. By saying kind of a repeat from this morning for some of you, uh, the information that I have right now is, is it's good. It's general. It's preliminary because this investigation is still in its early stages, even though we're hours into this. The information I give out or I have given out could change at any time. Uh, we want to update it as possible, but um, uh, things can change day to day, hour to hour, potentially. Um, so with that, let me tell you what happened this morning. King County Sheriff's Office re received a few phone calls this morning, 911 calls, uh, about some kind of disturbance with gunfire at a residential house uh, behind us, uh, the 7700 block of Lake Alice Road. Uh, on the way out here, so deputies from all over the north part of King County came out here from Sammamish, uh, Snoqualmie Pass, as far as Redmond Ridge, all rushed out here. Uh, yeah, so again, I'm, I am, my mic's still hot here because I want to jump in. So this, this was a very heavy duty mutual. This was multi-jurisdictional. And you're going to hear him talk about all the jurisdictions that had to work together in, in this uh, incident which, oh my gosh, those are complicated when you're doing that. But um, usually it's, they handle it at the scene. So they have designated um, people who are in charge of their particular part of the incident. And then those scene managers will talk to each other. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, at this call, in route, we learned that there was uh, a neighbor who had medical experience who was uh, providing aid to an injured individual, uh, presumably who had been shot but was surviving. And she is alive. She's in the hospital. And I'm not going to share her name because she's a minor. When deputies got here, they discovered um, uh, sort of a chaotic scene. But what they did when they entered the property is they immediately took one uh, young male, teenage male, into custody. They discovered that there was, in fact, one injured teenager. That uh, teenager was given medical attention and was quickly transported to Harborview Medical Center. When deputies entered the residence and property itself, uh, they discovered five deceased individuals inside the home. These included two uh, adults and three juveniles. I don't have the specific ages of the juveniles, but I think it's fair to say that they were young teenagers. Um, uh, beyond that, I don't know any uh, demographic information on them. Once those bodies were discovered, clearly we understand that this is a hugely significant uh, crime scene. And uh, we... By the way, which ties up everybody for a long time, for lots of good reasons, but it means that once this happens, you're down, you're down a bunch of people for a period of time. So you got to manage with what's left or who you have available. And it can really be a challenge. We started our uh, incident command structure process where we started determining, uh, first of all, we get the scene safe. Second of all, we determine what resources we need, uh, who we're going to call out, how we're going to replace individuals that have other duties throughout the uh, department. Um, and, and that really started around 6.30 a.m. and we've been doing that ever since. One of the first steps was to call out our King County Sheriff's Office Major Crimes Unit. They're going to be the lead investigators in this uh, case. They'll, they'll live with the case from today until it's, um, until it's concluded sometime in the, in the distant future. 
along with that task, we called out the State Patrol, the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab uh, Crime Scene Response Team. It was determined that uh, this is a very significant scene with multiple victims, uh, a difficult scene. And, and I agree that that was a great decision. And um, yeah, because the resources that they have and the incidences that they've handled and the experience that they have under their belt. So really good call. We needed the expertise of the State Patrol's crime lab to come and really take ownership of the forensic side of this. We do that because it really gives us a opportunity to know who our scientists are gonna be as the case moves forward. It also gives our detectives and major crimes unit a little break from having to do the forensic side of it because we do have other homicide investigations that they're continuing to go out on and that they have in their in their queues. Uh, let me take a break for a second here. Take a look at a couple notes. And the reason why he has to check that is because all he can talk about is what he's allowed to talk about. And it's what it is, it's what's being, what can be released to the press is essentially what he's looking at. And a PIO position is pretty stressful. So you might notice uh, Officer, Mel well, Deputy Mellis, Mike Mellis, um, shake a little bit, but he's doing a great job. So I wanted to acknowledge that uh, aside from just King County Sheriff's Office, folks, deputies coming out to the scene, we were assisted by uh, Issaquah Police Department, they came out and helped us. We had uh, other units come out and assist. So as I talked about our incident command structure, we determined that, well, through our protocols, we're gonna call out uh, uh, members of the King County Prosecutor's Off. And that was a slip. So that's shorthand. And he goes back and he corrects that because you can't use shorthand when you're talking to the public. So, yeah, he goes back and gives the long version. Excuse, excuse me. Uh, through our protocols, we determined that we would be calling the King County Prosecutor's Office to send out uh, one of the prosecuting attorneys. That's very standard for us at a homicide scene. Uh, that prosecutor, much like our lead detectives, will stay with the case from today until it's concluded at some point. Which means the wolves are hunting. And that's my favorite thing. Besides that, we'll have the King County Medical Examiner's Office bringing out investigators and their doctors so that they get a first-hand uh, uh, opportunity to see the scene themselves. All of these people will be staying with the case throughout its, its life, so to speak. I want to be clear that what had happened here this morning had essentially concluded before the 911 call was made or before deputies arrived. All right, so he's going to cover a little bit about the 911 call, or calls, and I've got some takeaways on that, too. In other words, there was no uh, significant confrontation with the young man that was taken into custody. What had happened had happened. It was done. Uh, there was no... Uh, uh, his detention happened without uh, any issues or any injuries. That young man is uh, going to be booked today into the King County uh, Youth Center. Uh, for lack of a better term, that's the juvenile jail for King County. And uh, that's where that young man, young man will be. Uh, notifications have been made to family members. I think by now, most neighbors have figured out that this is a significant event. You think? <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to throw that in there, dark humor. Um, we all develop it. Um, we are going to be here as an investigative team for days, uh, absolutely through today, absolutely through tomorrow, and I don't know how long it's gonna take. It's gonna take as long as it takes, and that's how long we'll keep the scene secure. That also means that some people might be brought in from the rotation to help cover those shifts like he was talking about, because that's gonna be kind of a resource hog, but for obvious reasons, they have to use it. I think that's kind of it for my uh, presentation, but is there questions, I suppose? Mr. Rick, can you tell us the age of that senior officer the custody and if she has anything to say? I can only say that the, the young man appears to be school-aged, more like a high school-aged person. I don't want to be wrong if I give you a certain age, but he's a, he's a young, young teen. He's a teenage, mid-teens, yeah. Tragic, man.
Sure. So what our deputies discovered in the house was two adult uh, individuals and three obvious juveniles. I'm not going to say what their roles in life. I, I can't even say for sure whether this is a parent and children. I just don't know the relationships. They could be any type of relationship. So I'm going to withhold uh, confirming any relationships, but it does appear to be that this is a family incident. Uh, clearly a domestic violence incident that involves not only uh, a young man who's now in significant uh, trouble. Yes, he is in significant trouble. I like the way he put that. Um, good job, Mac. And he, uh, it involves firearms, young men and firearms. Yeah, thanks. In fact, I did want to clarify a couple things about the initial call out. I know there's been some word uh, about the way the call came out and it was described as a potential suicide or uh, that in fact somebody had committed suicide potentially by hanging. So this word is going to go into the details more about how the call came in and how it was designated. And this is where I'm going to have some more takeaways. As we speak now, several hours later, we've determined that that was a miscommunication, a misunderstanding between the 911 caller and our call taker. The word hiding might have been misconstrued as hanging. And so our deputies did come in thinking we had some sort of a suicidal situation or perhaps a completed suicide. Which makes, makes it a completely different call. So they came in expecting something that, that was completely different. And that's why, again, if something comes in, if it sounds like an unusual thing, you know, like somebody telling you there's a hanging, you're going to want to clarify that. You're going to want to say hanging, like, and you, you hang up a hanger with your coat, or you hang up your coat, or is it um, something else? That I, you know, can you help clarify? Because you want to make sure that you're you're making your scene as safe for your responders as possible. And if you get your information wrong, that's on you, and that call is going to get pulled. So this this call that he's talking about, this 911 call, 100% is being pulled and screened and getting prepared for evidence. So that's going to be played in court. Um, they're going to pull all of them, anything that's directly related anyway. So like if the extra neighborhood, you know, if they get enough neighbors that called in, but there's like 20 neighbors that called in saying, I heard a gunshot. Um, and, but they only have like a few, a handful that are close. They'll go with the ones that are closer because of the way that, I hate to say this, but gunshots will echo off the water. And this area where they live, where this incident happened, is right off the lake. And a really expensive area, like multi-million dollar homes. So, yeah, kind of a kind of a strange place to be. But really, once they got on scene, uh, met with the first witnesses, met with the young men that they ultimately took in custody, and of course found the deceased bodies, it became evident that there was no uh, hanging involved. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the specific content of the initial 911 calls because, I, as you all know, those actually become evidence. Not only do they become evidence, but if there was if it was an obvious statement that was just misheard, if it was clear as a bell and they misheard it or just mistyped it or whatever, uh, that's disciplinary. But I don't know. I don't know the person who took the call with that specific incident. So otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it because I don't talk about, you know, people I know. Sure. I know that the person uh, that was transported to the hospital with injuries to uh, at least two parts of their body uh, was a teenager, probably, again, mid-teens. These are not small toddlers. These are not uh, kids in the single digits, as far as I know. And she's alive. So that means that there's a witness. A living witness is, is just golden. Um, I use the term firearms in general. I know that the deaths were perpetrated by firearm. I don't know if there's multiple firearms in the house. I don't know how many were used. Um, that is something that our major crimes unit detectives are physically looking at right now as we speak. So can you tell us if 
the, 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 the team that you've taken into custody and the team that went to the hospital, are they related? And is that a good assumption? They live in the same house, so I'll be, I'll be clear. The young man that was taken into custody and the other teen that was injured and is now at the hospital, they do reside at that same house. I don't know their uh, relationships. I can certainly surmise that maybe they're siblings, but I can't say that right now. I don't know what the relationship was other than that they reside at the home together. And this is why you direct all the calls to the PIO, which again, if he's the PIO for this scene, just say you get like, oh, I've had, you know, I'll help explain it. So just say CNN gives you a phone call. There's a reporter from CNN, some big named whoever, or Fox News calls, and some big name whoever. I don't watch a lot of television. <laughs> um, if they call and they say, hey, you know, I'm calling to get information about this incident, which will happen like all damn day. Whenever there's a big incident, you're going to get calls from the press or, you know, TV stations or what have you. You refer every last one of them to the public information officer, which, again, for this one is this gentleman. Upon his, you taking him, detaining this team, is there anything that he said that you might be able to share with us? I can't share anything about what our major crimes detectives uh, said during their interview. Also... Just say, because this can happen too, just say you're actually the person who took the call and you're still on shift and the news people are calling in, you still say nothing and, and refer to the PIO. It doesn't matter how much information you have. None of that information belongs to the press. None of it belongs to them. The person that handles the information with what they're allowed to say for, for what's available to share is directly through the PIO. Hopefully it was clear. Let me know if it's not, and I'll clarify down below. Use what they learned. I know that they've done, been, they've been doing their job. They would have been interviewing the injured uh, individual. They certainly would have been uh, interviewing our, what we'll call the juvenile suspect. And the content of those conversations is not uh, appropriate for release right now. With the three kids, were they boys, girls? And I know you said that there was possibly gunshots for the five victims. Did they have any gunshots? Well, I'm not going to speak to the exact cause and manner of death. That'll be something the King County uh, Medical Examiner's Office does. Uh, however, th we were called out as a gunfire disturbance to begin with. So it's fair to say that that is clearly what we think had happened, but I haven't been inside the crime scene. The investigators are actually just now getting to the crime scene as far as looking at the physical bodies. The King County Medical Examiner's Office isn't here yet and they probably won't be here for several hours if not tomorrow sometimes we need to leave the evidence where it is and and deceased bodies are quite often evidence and i know it's tough to say sometimes but those uh we might need to do what it takes to keep the evidence in its best uh, uh, condition for the medical examiner to see and if and they picked a really good compassionate person to be the pio for this um thank you thank you mike mellis for everything you do if that's today or tomorrow uh they'll be there until it's until we're done examining them thanks i do not know uh the makeup of these children other than that that they are uh teenagers and i don't know um, their exact ages i don't know their sexes at least that's, that's something that the detectives haven't released to me yet. And no, he does not look like Tom Cruise, so shush. <laughs> I knew it went through your brain. Don't say it. So the... the residence that this happened is a single family residence it is on the lakeside down the street and it's a house that's very likely multi-million it is just past or right near the tent where they're working right now i have no reason to think that there's going to be any additional arrests i do not believe that there's any uh continued concern of uh, the neighborhood safety uh, or general safety to the public this incident was a very contained tragedy within a family or with an extended family or the residents here uh, and 
as bad as it is, at least it stayed contained within this property. Okay, that that's a valid thing. It, yeah, at least other people weren't killed. Very valid. Sure. So I think earlier today we talked about maybe stakeholders is not the right phrase, but but there are plenty of concerned individuals and entities when something like this happens all over the country. I, I certainly don't blame the school district to, to want to put something out. Uh, it's within their right. They may not have all the accurate information. It's, it's something that we wouldn't release yet as far as, the again, the demographics of who these people are, um, the, whether they're students here or somewhere else or homeschooled. All those things will be documented within the case reports, but these reports are not going to be completed or available for really months down the road. And that is also true. So that's why when they designate the PIO for an incident, um, sometimes they rotate people out, but very rarely. Uh, that person is the one who gets the correct information to share without sharing too much. Um, you share too much or anything about really specific key evidence and it just completely can ruin a, a complete disaster for everything um because they need to be able to secure the scene and get all the evidence let the detectives do their work let the csi do their work coroner do their work all that good stuff um, i'm sure we will be able to give updates as the days go on i suspect that this briefing right now will be the last one for today um, but, you know, by all means, please ask. So, so <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I did do a general search of this address and really found nothing of interest. There was no repeated calls out here. The police haven't come out to this address really for any significant reason for years. So it's nothing that the local police department knew as a, quote, problem house uh, at all. Sure. So, yes, yeah, so what gives us the right to be on the property is a, a court authorized search warrant. That's the first thing our major crimes units uh, detectives had to do. It, what? That's a very strange question to be asked. Okay. I, I didn't hear what the question was. But what gives you the right to be on the property? Um, they, they do their paperwork, man. That search warrant has been obtained and they have uh, served it and they're continuing to serve it right now. I would, based on my experience on these type of cases, this will not be the only search warrant that has been um, uh, sought or granted. Yeah, because we're going to, this, right now, what was served is the search warrant for uh, the property for the scene, which is normal for that to happen, and then things like search warrants for electronic devices, search warrants for locked containers, because um, a locked container like a safe would be something different than, you know, doing a general search of the home. But yeah, there's all kinds of search warrants that go into this stuff. You talk about social media. I would think that uh, Oh yeah. anybody interested in this case would want to know what led up to it, most importantly. And were there things that were uh, red flags or signs? And social media will, will certainly be part of that. That will require additional search warrants search warrants for electronic devices, search warrants for uh, cell phones, for social media apps. Yep. Uh, in 2024, there's a lot of search warrants that need to be issued, served uh, on various companies nowadays. So I would expect that to happen here. I have no information about any pets being killed, but the, the house does have uh, some animals and it's really our protocol to come and get uh, get the scene cleared out of animals and things that might potentially destroy evidence. So the animals come out right away, uh, animal control takes care of them, and we'll, you know, do whatever it is with their protocols to release them to somebody. Well, 
I guess in the public memory, Carnation came to everybody's mind. Same. Exactly. So the Carnation thing that he's talking about was, uh, was a, a mass murder of a family perpetrated by two individuals. That was in 2007 in Carnation, Washington. And uh, all these people were killed on Christmas Day in Carnation. As we all responded, those who've been around long enough, like myself and many of these detectives and uh, officers, the Carnation and myself. from 2007 certainly was an obvious comparison. Unfortunately, since 2007, we've had several domestic violence, multiple victim homicides uh, over the years. Even even in this general area, I, I, without getting into specifics, we've had we've had plenty of cases like this. Um, each one a tragedy. Each one. Um, for their own nuanced reasons that they occurred. Um, and hopefully we'll come to some kind of a conclusion as to why this happened. Right. So that's what they're going to want next, right? So the fact that they have a living witness and they have the perpetrator in custody, they might get the answers. So we might actually get, um, get that info. Hopefully in the next week or so. And when I get it, if I do, I'll share it. I don't have a specific answer as to what crime he's going to be booked on based on my experience in this business. Uh, he's going to be booked on some type of a uh, murder first degree, murder second degree charge initially. Keep in mind, though, there's a large difference between what you're booked under and what you're charged under and what you're ultimately convicted or acquitted under. So these things can change. So the initial booking, although it's going to have the word murder in it, uh, could change. All right. So that was Monday. And early this morning, there was an update. So let me go ahead and play that. We are not naming the 15-year-old who is being held here in Seattle because he's a minor who has not been charged yet. Today, his case was the focus at this courthouse. The state is asking uh, the court make uh, probable cause findings for five counts of murder in the first degree. A 15-year-old accused of shooting and killing Mark and Sarah Humiston and their three children and injuring a fourth child waived his right to appear. These are not proven facts, uh, merely allegations. The court hearing comes one day after a chaotic scene. I was going to start up there at medic. Just before 5 a.m. on Monday, the 911 calls about gunfire started coming in. Multiple, multiple GSW. Leading law enforcement down Lake Alice Road in Fall City. GSW victim. Where the sheriff's office says deputies made a tragic discovery at a home. King County Council member Sarah Perry issued a statement Monday saying five family members out of seven were tragically killed. She says, my heart aches for the lives lost and all who are struggling to make sense of this loss right now. What we want to look at are the details gathered by investigators and what we can show to the court. Prosecutors say the 15-year-old arrested for the crime does not have a criminal history in King County. No indication that he's come to the prosecutor's office before, no previous cases, no first appearances. That's that's unusual to see these kinds of allegations with no previous contact with the prosecutor's office, but that's what we have here. The serious allegations were the focus in this courtroom today. Let's, uh, let's back this up a little bit. So I'm going to show you something really quick. Where'd she go? Where did she go? Where'd you go? There we are. So, uh, that's, that's the mental health people. For the, it says MHP negotiator. This, this is one of those things where they handle more of the environmental things with people. So, because again, scene management, there's going to be family members, there's going to be uh, all kinds of people that are going to want to get resources, so previous contact with the prosecutor's office, but that's what we have here. The serious allegations were the focus in this courtroom today. They create the highest possible risk to community safety, and I order secure detention. Prosecutors anticipate a case referral from investigators as early as Thursday for a charging decision, and another hearing is scheduled for Friday. 
in Seattle. Natalie Swaby, King 5 News. All right. So with that, uh, you know, again, if I get my grabby little hands on more information, I'll share it because chances are this is going to roll out a lot like the uh, Christmas carnation killing. This is a very high end neighborhood that this mass murder happened in. And it's actually getting national press. So, yeah, that rinky dinky courtroom, they might need to figure out what they're going to do with that. <laughs> But um, just tragic. All of it's tragic. But with that, everybody, uh, thank you for hanging out with me in the break room. Please take care. Stay safe. Don't be naughty. And until next time, bye-bye.